Hello, I hope you're having a great day today in modern church history. We take another look at the life of Jonathan Edwards, and today we meet a woman named Sarah Pierpont. Young Jonathan Edwards, as a graduate student, has fallen head over heels in love with a young girl, and we're going to meet Sarah. Also, now Jonathan Edwards has completed his studies, and the question is, what will he do? He's like a college student. He's graduated from college. He's got his graduate degree. And his dad thinks it's time for him to get a job as a pastor. Yet the young man has a lot of desires and hopes when it comes to academic accomplishments. And so today we're going to see how Jonathan Edwards, along some journeys in the province of God, ends up at Yale as a tutor. And then finally we will see how after a very, very difficult and melancholy time at Yale, the Lord opens the door for him to become the assistant pastor in Northampton, where he can help out his famous Grandpa Solomon Stoddard. By 1723, when Edwards was a master student, he had fallen in love. We look at the uncommon spiritual union that he had with Sarah Pierpont. It's during the time of his master's studies. And the first evidence we have that Jonathan Edwards has a love interest is a poetic statement that he wrote about a teenager named Sarah Pierpont. So Edwards is age 20, and he writes something that expresses his, his astonishment and his delight in a girl, and guess how old she only is? 13. To the youthfulness of the girl, Sarah Pierpont, who was only 13, it's very fitting that Edwards wrote about her in the way that he did. He wrote about his delight in her in terms of a spiritual, platonic delight. But Edwards had more than a spiritual, platonic delight in this girl. He was falling in love. Listen to what he wrote about this young girl who had caught his eye. He wrote, they say there is a young lady in New Haven who is beloved of that almighty being who made and rules the world, and that there are certain seasons in which this great being, in some way or other invisible, comes to her and fills her mind with exceeding sweet delight, and that she hardly cares for anything except to meditate on him, that she expects after a while to be received up where he is, to be raised out of the world and caught up into heaven being assured that he loves her too well to let her remain at a distance from him always. There she is to dwell with him and to be ravished with his love, favor, and delight forever. Therefore, if you present all the world before her with the richest of its treasures, she disregards it and cares not for it, and is unmindful of any pain or affliction. She has a strange sweetness in her mind and sweetness of temper, uncommon purity in her affections is most just and praiseworthy in all her actions. And you could not persuade her to do anything thought wrong or sinful if you'd give her all the world, lest she offend this great being. She is of a wonderful sweetness, calmness, and universal benevolence of mind, especially after those times in which this great God has manifested himself to her mind. She will sometimes go about singing sweetly from place to place and seems to be always full of joy and pleasure, and no one knows for what. She loves to be alone and to wander in the fields and on the mountains and seems to have someone invisible always conversing with her. Now that's a remarkable description of a 13-year-old girl, isn't it? God had shown great grace to this 13-year-old Sarah so that she had a very intimate relationship with God already. She lived often in joy and delight in God. I love how Jonathan says it's like when she's walking around in God's world, it looks like someone invisible is talking to her because, of course, she was praying and she was talking to God. And, and I think Jonathan also, of course, sees almost like a mirror image of himself in the opposite sex. Now, he loves to be out in the creation, loves to be outdoors, loves to be singing, praising God, and now he meets this young girl who is 13 but shows the same spirituality. And so Jonathan is struck by this young girl. Now, commenting on this 
poetic description of Miss Pierpont, George Marsden says that Sarah was Edward's Beatrice, and there he's referring to how Dante, the medieval poet, had this sort of platonic love for a, a girl named Beatrice. Marsden says, whatever his underlying emotions, he expressed them as pure platonic Christian love. Sarah was his Beatrice. Indeed, Edwards lived in a world of spiritual realities that was in some respects closer to the medieval Dante's than to our own. Sarah was the perfectly embodied ideal of all that he aspired to be, the pure spiritual being, sweet-tempered, singing sweetly, always full of joy and pleasure. Whatever is the case, you can see that this young girl was quite remarkable and unique, and she stood out to Jonathan Edwards as a young girl who had been born again and who had a spiritual relationship with God. Sarah was the daughter of a deceased minister named James Pierpont Sr. Mary Hooker Pierpont, who was Sarah's mom, came from a ministerial dynasty in Connecticut. Jonathan's dad, Timothy, had been a friend and co-belligerent with the Reverend James Pierpont Sr., and so the two families no doubt had known each other. When Jonathan arrived on the campus at Yale in New Haven, what happened is that Sarah's mom lived right kitty corner across from the campus, across the campus green or the lawn. So there was a connection between these two families before Jonathan and Sarah fell in love. And then on top of that, what helped, I think, the relationship is that Jonathan became friends with James Pierpont Jr. So Sarah had an older brother, and in fact, he would be a uh, peer of Edwards at Yale College. And so, you know, Jonathan could go with his friend, and they could stop by at the home of the Pierponts, and he could see and talk to Sarah. In fact, a few years in the future, in the middle of a very difficult time at Yale, where I think Edwards was just overwhelmed, probably dealing with all the tensions of dealing with students who could be rebellious. In 1725, God would comfort Edwards with a blossoming relationship and courtship of Sarah Pierpont. Marsden writes of that time, he says, Meanwhile, the light of his earthly love for Sarah Pierpont shone ever more luminously. By the spring 1725, their relationship had blossomed into a suit for her hand. Sarah was still only 15, but by May or June, they were engaged to be married. The wedding would be in two years. Sarah would be considerably younger than the average New England bride, but such an early engagement was within the bounds of propriety. The approval of James Pierpont Jr., sometimes his colleague as tutor at Yale, may have helped speed the courtship and provided ready access for Jonathan to socialize at the widow Pierpont's house. So isn't that striking that this girl at age 15 already is engaged to be married to Jonathan? Now, their marriage was, was put off, and it would be only after Jonathan became a pastor in Northampton that the wedding would occur. But what an encouragement this was for him at this time. And, and this couple seemed to be made for each other. Jonathan, with, with his intense spiritual experiences, she with hers, unfortunately, he would struggle with the assurance of his salvation, and she being raised in this whole context as well, she would also experience that dark side of some of the Puritan legacy, that war on assurance. And, and so that would also damage her. You know, it was hard to grow up as a young woman in a church where ministers could major in hypocrisy and almost imply that young people couldn't have the assurance of their salvation. And there's a lack of a judgment of charity of covenant youth. Later on, Sarah would also have some very profound experiences during a time of revivalism and excitement in Northampton. And Edwards would write about her. He'd write about how, how she was someone who was a spiritually minded, mature Christian. He would mention who she was. He would mention her sex, whether she, the person he talk about, talk, was talking about was male or female. But he talked about how there would be times where she would just suddenly go into times of just constant celebration of God and thoughts of heaven. So she would have some very, very heightened emotional senses of spiritual realities. Now they would have a, a long, well not so long as you could hope, but they would have a, a very fruitful and wonderful marriage. 
So that on his deathbed, when Edwards was at Princeton, where he had become the new president at the end of his life, and he had gotten a smallpox inoculation from which he was now dying, he gave some closing words to his daughter, Lucy, who was there at his bedside. He said to Lucy this, he says, and in this statement, he makes this famous reference to the uncommon union between him and Sarah. He says, he says, this is what you need to tell mom. He says, it seems to me to be the will of God that I must shortly leave you. Therefore, give my kindest love to my dear wife. You see, his wife was back in Stockbridge, where they had, where Edwards had been a missionary to the Indians. Edwards says, and tell her that the uncommon union which has so long subsisted between us, has been of such a nature as I trust is spiritual, and therefore will continue forever. And I hope she will be supported under so great a trial and submit cheerfully to the will of God. Now with those dying words, Edwards is celebrating the close spiritual relationship he had enjoyed with his wife all of his life. Throughout his ministry, for example, before they go to bed, she would come alone into his study and the two of them would pray together. That was part of their spiritual union. And Edward makes a nice point. He says, just like we've enjoyed this wonderful spiritual union in this life, this spiritual relationship, he says, I trust it will continue in the life to come. And in the providence of God, remember, Sarah would die in only, only a few months after her husband and they would be reunited in heaven. Now I've jumped ahead a little bit in talking about the end of Jonathan and Sarah's life, but I, while I was talking about Jonathan meeting Sarah as a young girl, I wanted to point you to that famous statement that he would many years later make on his deathbed about how wonderful of a wife she had been. So Edwards graduated, he had his master's degree, he had his bachelor's and his master's, now what would he do? What would this young budding scholar do? His dad is only thinking of him getting into the ministry, and so his dad begins to push him to take a pastorate in a town that's rather close to East Windsor, where dad is at, in the town of Bolton. As for Edwards himself, I think because of his intellectual interests, he wants to be at a place where the life of the mind will be fostered. On the one hand, I think he probably has an interest in becoming a tutor at Yale, where he can continue to grow and pursue his studies. I think he also is interested in maybe finding a pastorate in New York City, which was a city he had loved and a place that was a happening place. So the question is, what would he do now? During this time period, too, when he has graduated and before he becomes a tutor at Yale, he also is very interested in scientific manners. It's during this whole period of time that he's going to pen some of his scientific writings, where he's writing about insects and spiders, and he's writing about the nature of light. He's trying to wrestle with the nature of reality, studying some of the latest physics. Well, Timothy Edwards, I don't think, shared Jonathan's passion for that type of research, or even academic research. In fact, Timothy Edwards himself never publish any academic type writings. He, there was only one sermon of Timothy Edwards that was published in his lifetime. But don't get the idea that Timothy, idea that Timothy was an effective preacher. He was. He was an effective preacher. Apparently, he preached extemporaneously. So dad is saying you should take up the pastorate in Bolton, and Edwards is back home. And you know, that can be rough when a college graduate comes back home and is living under the parental roof, especially if dad and mom start acting like keep acting like they're still dad and mom. And there was apparently some tension that developed. Now, it's not exactly clear exactly what was going on between Timothy and Esther and their son, Jonathan. But there's two possibilities. Biographers think that one thing that's going on is that when Jonathan Edwards shared with his dad and mom the sort of experiences that he had had, that he believed definitely demonstrated that he actually had undergone a genuine conversion. Dad and mom thought, well, mo maybe this is just more of the same of, you know, like when you were a boy, you know, you'd go build this booth in the woods and then you get excited and you'd pray for a while and then, then that would be the end of it. So 
his parents weren't so convinced necessarily about his genuine conversion. He knew he was a child of God, though, at this point. One issue might have been that his dad didn't think that Jonathan, in the whole process of you know, getting converted, had experienced sufficient terrors. Gone through a phase where he was just terrified of being punished in hell, like he ought to have been. And later, Edwards would write this, and this is a hint that there was a disagreement between him and his dad. He said, It never seemed to be proper to express my concern that I had by the name of terror. So what he's doing is he's challenging his dad's view of the steps that you had to jump through in order to be genuinely converted. In fact, it was Jonathan at this stage is wrestling with what some of the Puritans had taught about the various steps involved for conversion. That comes out in how he talks about how he wonders why. He wants to search out the reasons for why the Puritans in the past used to be converted in those steps. Notice what he's thinking. He's thinking that somehow in the past, when you know, the Pilgrim Fathers were converted, they had jumped through these various hoops that some Puritan theologians had laid out. Now, I think that probably wasn't actually the case, but I think what was the case is that people thought, they were taught by their ministers that they had to have this experience and this experience, and so they would kind of try to follow the line so that they could say that they're Christians. But now Edward says, well, I got to figure that out. Why they were converted in that way originally. Yes, go ahead. So I was like wondering, so like we don't have to go through really steps to be converted, don't we? Correct. Not in this legalistic way. Now, what happens, of course, when a person is converted, a number of things happen, right? When when God regenerates you, for example, and, and gives you a new heart, what suddenly changes? Suddenly you're truly sorry for your sins, aren't you? Suddenly you're also trusting that Christ is your Savior. And then just like, for example, you can have an assurance of many things. Like, I have an assurance that my earthly biological dad is my dad. We also can have the assurance that God is our Heavenly Father and Christ is our Savior. Now, you know, with Jonathan challenging his dad, he's not saying that there aren't genuine signs of True conversion. In fact, later on as a minister, he'll emphasize that, you know, one of the general, one of the evidences of the fact that you have been truly converted, well, it's that you walk in good works. You walk in love towards the people around you. And um, so that's one source of tension. The other source of tension, I think, is that Dad is trying to push Jonathan to take this pastorate at this little church in Bolton in the sticks. And because Jonathan didn't have anything else to do, you know, nothing else was lined up, he finally consented to that. But I think what happened is that Jonathan agreed to become the pastor at Bolton, conditional on him not having a call to become a tutor at Yale. So what happened is that for six months, he did fill the pulpit in this little town. But what happened is that as the new year came, as 1724 came, the trustees at Yale appointed Jonathan to be one of the two tutors. There still was no rector, and George Marsden thinks that Edwards must have had an agreement with the saints at Bolton that his pastorate was provisional, because two weeks after receiving that appointment from the trustees, he's, he's saying goodbye, he's leaving, and he's heading off to yell to become what we call an assistant professor. Yes, go ahead. I think you just answered the question. Like when we think of tutor, we think of some some you know part time job, you know where you sit yeah. in the building. But I think he, yes. he was an assistant. Yeah. So the question is, what is a tutor today? When we think of a tutor, we think of someone who maybe is a part time job and he just he or she helps kids with their homework or something like that. But here, a, being a tutor was being what we would call like an assistant professor. Basically, you had a full professor as the rector, and then you had assistant professors. But because there was no rector, Jonathan and one other tutor, now he would have a, a few different colleagues during this time, they would be the two professors in the college who would be training about 40 to 50 students and would have to teach them all four years in the curriculum. So this would be a very, very busy work for the, the young man. On top of that, what would happen is that 
the new library at Yale needed to be organized. And so Jonathan and the other tutor would be paid little additional income so that they would organize and index the library. Remember, this is the library that had got Timothy Cutler in trouble when he read some of the Anglican books in there. Well, Jonathan apparently did feel a call to engage in more scholarly work and preparation. Maybe he thought he was kind of young, too, to become a minister. But I think he wanted to be in Yale where he could use the library and he could continue his intellectual work. Little did he know, though, what he was going to be getting himself into. But of course, there was another reason why Edwards wanted to go back to New Haven. And that was because of a young girl named Sarah, who he could be closer to. And so Jonathan Edwards accepts the appointment, and in June of 1724, he is now at Yale taking up his position as a tutor. And we could talk about his time at Yale as the time in which he was a melancholy tutor. Depressed tutor. Now, I'm sure the high point of all of this is that he could see Sarah. Sarah is now 14 years old, but mature beyond her years, and now he has a chance to see her very, very often. Yale didn't have a president yet or a rector, and so Edwards and his fellow tutor are going to be very busy. But before he even takes up his work, in the commencement week, in 1724, something happened, and we don't know what it was, that triggered a psychological crisis for the new tutor. Now, in the past, at the time of the commencement exercises, the students would sow their wild oats, and, and they'd do all kinds of crazy things. In fact, the year before, the trustees had to talk about how if anybody busted windows during that period of time, or shot up guns, or did other kind of destructive stuff, you know, there would be penalties for them. It's not clear exactly what happened, but something happened that triggered Edwards. You know how it is with clinical depression. There can be a trigger event that can lead a person to suddenly falling into despair. This is what Jonathan Edwards wrote on June 6 in his diary in the year 1724. Saturday night, June 6, this week has been a remarkable week with me with respect to despondencies, fears, perplexities, multitudes of cares, and distraction of mind. Being the week I came hither to New Haven in order to entrance upon the office of tutor of the college, I have now abundant reason to be convinced of the troublesomeness and vexations of the world, and that it will never be of another kind of work. Now, we don't know what exactly triggered the melancholy. Edwards never tells us what threw him into psychological and spiritual turmoil. And I think what made it even worse for him is that, remember, he's constantly struggling spiritually with the question of assurance. Now, on top of that, he's clinically depressed, it seems. And you know how when people get clinically depressed, well, then they can struggle with, you know, am I a child? Does God love me? It could have been the wildness of the students that triggered this, or maybe at confrontations with people or students. Uh, but he recognized that that an event had happened that had triggered the crisis. He wrote again in his diary in September. This is what he wrote. Sep Saturday night, September 12. Crosses of the nature of that which I met with this week thrust me quite below all comforts in religion. They appear no more than vanity and stubble, especially when I meet with them, so unprepared for them. I shall not be fit to encounter them, except I have a far stronger and more permanent faith, hope, and love. Notice how, as a child of God, he's struggling under these despondencies. And we can experience that too. We can be so down the dumps, that we say, come on, I'm a child of God. Where's my faith? How come I'm not trusting in God to help me through this? And so Jonathan is experiencing that struggle. In fact, it wouldn't be until a few years later, I think, when all the stresses and the burden of his time as a tutor would be off of his shoulders, and he'd have a new job, becoming the assistant pastor with his grandpa, Solomon Saturday in Northampton, where I think he didn't have a lot of stress. Grandpa was leading the show. Everything was peaceful in town. And he got married to Sarah Pierpont, that suddenly the darkness would lift. 
Many years later, he described this difficult time saying, After I went to New Haven, I sunk in religion, my mind being diverted from my eager and violent pursuits after holiness by some affairs that greatly perplexed and distracted my mind. I think Jonathan Edwards was ready for something new. I think he was ready for a pastorate after a couple of years of being a tutor. Also, I think he was ready to get married. And I'm not sure that being a tutor at Yale paid enough so that a man could even support a family. So there's a number of good reasons for him to want to pursue a pastorate, especially a pastorate in Northampton. Now that was a prestigious pulpit. Solomon Stoddard, over a 50-year period of preaching, powerful extemporaneous sermons, during which he was actually referred to by people in that time as sort of the Pope of New England or the Pope of Massachusetts. That's how influential he was among the Congregationalist pastors. That he had really made a name for the church in Northampton. Plus the church in Northampton was a large church, an influential church. So it was an attractive pulpit. Now prior to this time, Solomon Stoddard apparently had been looking around for a potential replacement and certainly at this time a help. He was getting older, but he was still going strong yet. But he had a lot of relation who were in the ministry. There was a Williams clan that had a number of people. He had a number of grandsons who were potential replacements. So what happened is that because he was so influential, I'm sure he played a crucial role in leading the search for an assistant pastor who could be his replacement. And guess what grandpa wanted? Well, the generation below him were really getting pretty old already, so he's looked around among his grandsons. Now first, actually, there had been a different grandson who had been called to be an assistant pastor, and that hadn't worked out so well. And I'm sure Solomon is following the studies and the life of his daughter Esther's son, Edwards. And, of course, he's aware of of how Edwards has his bachelor's and his master's degree as a tutor. He he was probably there when Edwards gave his speech on justification by faith. And so Solomon Stoddard apparently decides that he's going to recommend Jonathan as an assistant. Now, the pulpit there was renowned. Solomon Stoddard was one of the most influential ministers. We're going to talk about some of his ideas um, that unfortunately weren't so good. But he was he was a Congregationalist Calvinist. He was a Puritan. He was going strong into his 80s. In fact, there was talk that such was his influence and the esteem with which he was held by people in New England that the road between Northampton and Boston had been improved so that as Stoddard got older, he could still make the yearly journey from Northampton to Boston for Harvard's commencement addresses and celebrations in Cambridge, which was right in the area of Boston. So that's the esteem with which he was held. Now the town of Northampton also had sufficient finances to support a minister, and even two in this case, and Jonathan now is ready for a change, a new job, and he would like to support his wife. And late in the year, in November 21 of 1726, the citizens of Northampton voted to call Jonathan with an overwhelming majority to call him to be an assistant pastor with his grandfather. And so the Lord now had provided a way for Edwards to transition from being at Yale to being in the pastorate. And this is how the Lord in his providence would bring Edwards to the town where he would have such a long and influential ministry and also where his time there would end with a great controversy. But that's because the Lord had other things for him to do, like become a missionary to the Indians, he could write some of those famous treatises. And then the Lord had plans for him to end up at a different college, at Princeton College, where he would die as the president. 